Hello, my Bill for Thousand Nation. How's everyone doing today? Hopefully everyone's having a great day. If not, I hope it gets better from here. We're back with another Mr. Ballin video. This one is titled Top 3 Random Encounters with Serial Killers. I'm excited. We've done one like this before. I really enjoyed it. All right. If you guys are as excited as I am, go ahead. Turn them lights down low. Put on something comfy. Couple something special. Let's get scared. I don't want to know how many serial killers' hands I've shaken. I mean, these are serial killers. Like, I've worked in grocery stores and shit. How many people have I, like, waited on? Like, you know what I mean? Have a great day. Have a blessed one. I murdered three people. I sure will. <laughs> That's fucking scary to think about, you know? Fuck that shit, bro. Experts believe in the United States alone, there are at least 2,000 active, uncaught serial killers just running wild. Which means if you live in America, Damn. you may have already had an interaction with a serial killer. You just didn't know it. But today, I'm going to share three progressively more disturbing cases Damn. of Americans that had an interaction with a serial killer, but came to find out later that it was a serial killer. But before we get into those stories, if you're like a fan that. of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, no, no please more, schedule you the like good. button for a fight with Paul on the day before Thanksgiving in Quincy, Massachusetts. Also, please subscribe to my channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Oh, Mr. Paul. Parents know best. After spending 21 years in the U.S. Army, a man retires yes. and moves to Central Florida with his wife and young son. Although his family had plenty of money because he had a pension coming in and his wife still worked full time, he just got bored really quickly after moving to Central Florida and decided he would just take a job doing something just to stay occupied. And so he ended up taking a job at a highway gas station. One of the primary reasons he chose this particular job is because the owners of the gas station didn't care if his son came along to help him stock shelves and hang out behind the cash register. Oh, that's and so cool for shit. years, that's just how it went. The man would work at the gas station and his son would tag along. Even after his son became a teenager and you'd think might be wanting to do other things, well, the town was so small, there was almost nothing to do. So his son still came along well into his teenage years. One that's night so cool in 1990, shit, his son, who was 15 years old at the time, was at the station and he was actually taking a break sitting outside on a picnic table. He was reading a magazine, drinking a Mountain Dew, and you know, it's dark out and he notices out of the corner of his eye that there is a woman walking off of the highway towards the gas station. It was a very quiet night at the time, so there's no cars getting gas, there's nobody there, and there's not really anybody even driving on the highway, and so that's why she really stood out to him. And he turns and he notices her and he thinks to himself, you know, no one ever walks to our gas station. We're on a highway, everybody drives here. So she must have must broken, be broken down, down and she must be coming here to try to use our phone to call a tow truck or something like that. So the woman is walking across the lot, coming closer or and closer hitchhiker. to the gas station. And the boy at this point has turned his attention back to his magazine. But he would say later that he kept looking up and keeping an eye on her because there was something off about her. The woman ultimately walks right behind him and goes in the door into the gas station. Doesn't acknowledge the boy, doesn't say hi to him, just walks straight inside. And she starts walking up and down the aisles of the gas station. Now, from where the boy was sitting, it's all glass, so he could clearly look in and see his father behind the counter, and he could see the head of this woman as she walked in and around all these aisles. And as soon as the woman was in the store, kind of pacing around the aisles, the boy put his magazine down and was just watching. And he noticed that she was not really shopping. She was just looking down for a few seconds, wouldn't pick anything up, so she wasn't buying anything. And she would look up at Shame. the counter where his father was. <clears throat> Get ready to stare you. at him. Rob you. And then she'd look Kill back you. down at what she was doing. And Maybe even eat your bowl. All the aisles. And at some point, the woman just kind of abandons this phony, I'm pretending to shop routine, and just walks up to the counter. Now, nobody else is in the store. There's okay. nobody else coming in. And so okay. the boy could actually fairly clearly hear what she was saying to his father. And she okay. told his father that she had broken down and she needed a ride. And could he drive her to Ocala, which was the next big town north of this gas station? And the boy would say that his father acted very strangely because his father is normally incredibly pleasant with all the customers. He's very chatty even. Like he talks to everybody who comes in the store. But as soon as this woman had gone in, 
His dad had seemed kind of dismissive and almost rude to this woman. And when she was talking to him, asking for a ride, he just said, no, I won't give you a ride. The woman is annoyed by how quickly she's been shot down. But instead of just taking no for an answer, she turns and looks at the boy, the boy who's sitting out on the bench, who's looking right at her. And she points at the boy and she says, what about him? Is he your son? Can he give me a ride? The boy notices that his father, who's not within her eyesight, is looking at his son going, no. Like, whatever she wants from you, you're gonna say no to it. And the boy's a little bit confused by this because he's still trying to understand why his dad was so against helping this woman because she clearly needs our help or someone's help, but he just took his dad at face value. And when the woman's pointing at him, he knew the boy that if she came over and asked him, he would say no. But it wouldn't come to that because the boy's father would say to the woman, no, my son's not gonna give you a ride. You need to leave here immediately. Do not come back, leave, we're not gonna help you. She's furious, she's cussing him out. She storms out and slams the door. She starts cussing at the boy and she walks off the whole time she's turning around and flipping them off and screaming profanities at them. But she ultimately walks off and the dad kind of followed her out and is standing next to his son as she walks off. And the boy asks his probably dad, a really well, good what thing. was her deal? Why did that happen? Why did, you, why did you not want to help her? And the dad just said, I don't know. There was just something, there was something off about her. And I, I don't know how to place it, but I did not want her around you. I, I knew I didn't want to give her a ride. I just, I knew she had to go. A year later, the boy is in his room when he hears his dad in the other room yelling for him to come in here and look at the TV. So he boy. runs into the TV room boy. and on the TV is the same woman from the gas station, better known as Eileen Warnos. She was a serial killer who used to pick yeah, up the male like victims seven dudes, right? at gas stations in Florida. It's unclear whether the boy or the boy's father were her next victims. But by the time she had shown up at that gas station, she had already killed four people. And following that interaction with them at the gas station, she had gone on to kill three more people, yeah, including yeah. someone in Ocala, Florida, which was the town she had asked them to give her a ride to. Eileen had been caught, that's why she was on TV, and she was later sentenced to death. Yep. In the late 1970s, oh, a medical man. student going to school in Chicago had just gotten out of class oh, and decided fuck. he didn't want to pay for a taxi, so he decided he would hitchhike his way home. Now, this was something he routinely did and at the time was socially acceptable. So he goes down to the road and he puts his thumb out and eventually a car pulls up and he would describe the man that is pulling up as looking normal and even friendly and lighthearted. It's a middle-aged guy and he tells the student, hey, come on in, hop inside, I'll give you a ride. The student did not feel threatened by this guy and felt like overall this was safe. And so he hops in the passenger seat he tells this man where he wants to go. He says, okay, and they start driving off. So as they're driving, it's silent in the car. They're not making chit chat, they're just driving along. And the student notices that the man misses the turn to go where he needs to go. And so the uh -oh. student turns to the man and says, hey, you know, you missed, you missed the turn. Do you mind turning around and going back this way? Or, you know, if you want, you can just drop me off here and, and I'm happy to walk, we're not that far away. The man, who had seemed really nice and lighthearted, suddenly had this really intense demeanor come over him. And he turns and looks at the student and goes, oh no, you're coming with me. The student is frozen in fear. He doesn't know what to do, but he knows immediately that this is not an idle threat. I don't know who he is, I don't know what's gonna happen, but it's gonna be bad for me, I have to get out. And so as soon as the car began to slow down, even a little bit, I mean, they're still driving, they're not stopped. The student unlocks the door, opens the car, and jumps out of the moving car and smashes into the ground, rolls against the side of the curb, but is ultimately unhurt. I mean, he's banged up from jumping out of a moving car, but he was able to stand up and run back to his house. He didn't call the police because he really didn't know what to tell them because he didn't have a great description of the guy. He didn't have his license plate and the guy didn't do anything totally like aggressive. It was more of a shit, threat, bro. but an ambiguous threat at best. It wasn't really clear what he wanted to do with him. It definitely did not seem good, but it just wasn't enough for him to call the police. And so the student just feels lucky that he got out of there and moves on with his life. A couple of years go by, the student at this point has basically forgotten about this encounter with the stranger. And he's sitting in a cafe, he's drinking some coffee and there's a TV on behind him. He wasn't paying attention to it, but the reporter on the TV said something that immediately piqued his interest. The reporter was talking about a guy that was currently on death row that apparently had removed all of the inside car door handles inside of his car after his first would-be victim, a college student, had apparently escaped by opening a car door while he was moving. 
The student runs over to the TV and sees on the screen there is an image of the guy they're talking about, this guy on death row, and it's the same guy who gave him a ride two years earlier. His name was John Wayne Gacy, AKA the killer clown. He had killed over 30 men and boys in Chicago, and yep. then after killing them in his clown room, he would stuff them into a secret crawl space in his basement. And although we can't be certain, it seems extremely likely that this med student was supposed to be the fuck? first victim uh, of John Wayne Gacy, but he leapt out of the car, no, forcing bro. John Wayne Gacy to change his strategy and make sure the next person was not able to do that. Fuck that, bro. No. No. In the 1970s, a young woman and young man were on their very first date together, and it wasn't going very well. It wasn't going badly, it was just really, really awkward. They just were not meshing at all. And so as they're getting ready to leave and retire for the night, the guy is thinking to himself, I have nothing to lose here, we're probably not going to go on a second date. And he says to the woman, hey, do you want to not go home right now and actually come on a hike with me? And he goes, I know this sounds like a terrible idea, but hear me out. I go mountain climbing in this area called Provo Canyon. It's not that far from here. There are these beautiful trails that lead up the side of the canyon to these amazing scenic overlooks. And tonight it's a new moon, so there's great visibility. And I just think that you might enjoy it. And so at first, the woman is obviously a little bit hesitant. But when he says, look, I go hiking there at night all the time. I love it out there. And I promise if there's any weirdness, if you don't like being there, we'll just turn around and leave. It's totally safe. And so after a little bit of coaxing, she finally says, okay, you know what? That sounds fun. Let's go do it. And so their date that had been really awkward suddenly became really exciting. And the two of them were kind of like thrilled, like, wow, look at us making our way up for a nighttime hike down Canyon. Downtown. And so they arrive at the, the mouth of this canyon and they're both obviously excited and they hop out and they start walking up this trail that brings them into a heavily forested section of the canyon. Now to this point, the guy felt like this was a really great idea. He really had gone hiking here a bunch and he really did know the area well. But as the trail brought them into the forested area, the guy remembers feeling this overwhelming sense of dread. He didn't know why, it was just like an overwhelming sense of anxiety that something bad was going to happen to them. But he had worked so hard to convince his date to come with him and had convinced her it was safe that he's not about to let on to her that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he put on, you know, his strong face and just kind of suppressed oh, that's it. A good he just movie. kept on walking. And That movie right there, that's a good movie. If I'm not mistaken, goes into like uh, one of those Japanese... Chinese, one of them forces, like a suicide force, basically. People go in there just to end it. And if I'm not mistaken, she's looking for her sister, twin sister, maybe. Like, it's a good movie. Like, I liked it. You know, holding her hand tight and they just continued their walk. But his sense of dread would just build and build to the point where he was really on edge. And what he didn't know, but would find out later, is that his date, the woman, she also had this horrible sense of dread as soon as they went into the forest, but she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to seem like a party pooper because he seemed really excited about it. At some point as they're walking down this path, the man steps on something that felt soft. He didn't know what it was, but it caused him to freeze immediately. And he's holding her hand. He kind of jerks her to get her to stop. And before he can even look down and see what he's standing on, he hears rustling coming from the bushes just off the trail. She hears it too. And both of them, without saying a word to each other, because again, you got to remember, they're both really stressed. They haven't let on to the other how stressed just they are. But around. they're both basically ready to leave. And so the two of them turn around and they hightail it out of there. He has no idea what he stepped on. They don't know what they heard in the bushes, but they don't care. The anxiety was so high, they just wanted to leave. Years later, that man and woman who had this very strange date would actually be married. And they'd be sitting down watching TV That's together cool. and they're flipping through the channels and they land on an interview with a death row inmate. And the interviewer is asking the inmate, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red-handed? And the guy being interviewed says, yes, one time. I was in the forest up in Provo Canyon one night and a young couple came walking up the trail. I didn't see him, so I only had a chance to jump into the bushes right next to the trail. And the guy actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. But for some reason, he didn't look down and see what he was standing on. And the two of them didn't notice me just a few feet away from them. They just turned around and walked away. Turns out that young couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy. 
Before Bundy was what? executed, he confessed to over 30 murders. But many people believe the true number of victims is much, much, much higher. So that's going to do it, guys. Let me know what you thought of these three stories in the comment section. And let me know how you would respond if it turned out you had... So if they would have been like, oh my god, there's a body and got away and called the police, like... What? His, 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 his killing number could be a lot lower. That's all I can say about it. ...had actually interacted with a serial killer. Not only will I respond to all the early commenters, I will all also right, pin... The... Oh my lord. That's some shit. <laughs> I love it. I don't know what I would do if I come to find out that I had to interact with the drained serial killer and I'm barely alive now just by sheer luck. Oh. Bro, I'd be playing motherfucking lottery every fucking day, homie. Yeah. All right, I really enjoyed today's story. If you enjoyed today's story as much as I did, please go down there, leave a thumbs up. It really does help the channel grow. While you're down there, going over and slap that subscribe button. We do some crazy stuff here. If you want to know when that crazy stuff happens, ding that bell. It might work for you. It might not. It probably won't. But if it do, if it do, jump in on one of my premieres, go over in the live chat and be like, hey, Bill. I was sitting there. I was right smack dabs in the middle of a church. And all of a sudden, I thought Jesus don't text me, but it was only you. I'm like, my bad. Leave a like and dip. That's all you got to do. As always, be good to one another. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Damn, Mr. Bone, I never want to shake no one's hand ever again because it might be a serial killer's. Thanks. <laughs> so much shit has been ruined be for me because of these videos, man. I can't do the videos no more. I'm going to be inside of a box. Just a box in the middle of a room. Nothing touching it. That's going to be my life. A box in the middle of a room. Surrounded by nothing. Because it's safe. Hey,